Recently I rambled over the top of some trailers about how the games industry used to be better than what we've got now. I figured I'd expand upon that musing in a more coherent way, with 10 reasons why it's more enjoyable to play games from the past than whatever's being shoveled our way in 2020. Retro games are cheaper. Even on sale, the most modern shooters will cost you 25 to 30 quid. Wait a few years and that'll come down to 10. Then it'll slip to that sweet spot below 5. The longer you wait, the cheaper it gets. A phenomenon known as patient gaming. Retro gaming takes it one step further, as many titles will drop out of commercial circulation altogether, or be distributed as freeware. The result being that you pay nothing or next to nothing for great games and can spend that hard-earned cash on important things, like a cat or that cosmetic surgery you were putting off. You're getting the best version. By choosing to delay your gratification, the result will be games that play better than when they were originally released. They will be fully patched up with bugs squashed, extra expansions and mods galore in some cases. Your prudent purchasing position will be rewarded even further with some games that simply weren't complete without their ultimate super awesome Game of the Year edition. One of the best examples of course being the collector's edition of TIE FIGHTER, which has 36 campaign missions in the base game, but an additional 40 added through expansions. Over twice the in-game resolution, enhanced cutscenes and full voice acting for all NPCs. This turns what was already a superb sequel into one of the greatest games ever made. Seriously, play TIE Fighter. You already know if it's good or not. Back in the day you had shareware and magazines. If a shareware version was good and the magazine review was also good, then chances were the game, shock horror, would be good. The job of most gaming publications nowadays is to advertise rather than review, so you'll plunge headfirst into the next hyped up title and a little nagging voice in your head will say, why am I not enjoying this? And you'll silence it with more alcohol or food in a constructive and healthy fashion. Then when the marketing lifespan is over, the community will look back in hindsight and say, hey, that actually wasn't very good. And the more time passes, the more hindsight is applied and you'll end up with a nice curated selection of titles that real people have played and enjoyed. And their consensus will drown out any previous agendas. It's free from digital rights management. I was playing Might and Magic 2 on my new computer. My brother wanted to play the new computer, so I stuck the game on a floppy disk and shoved that in the old computer. It worked. With all the launchers nowadays, you might think, well, I can just download a copy onto the other computer, no problem. Except there is. It's not actually your game. You're paying for the ability to lend the game via the service with a one-time charge to your account. Lose the account and the game is gone. Assuming the publisher doesn't break or change the game before that with a mandatory update you can't roll back. After that comes the subscription services and microtransactions. But then you consented to that happening when you agreed to use the digital platform in the first place. GOG.com does this better, but many of their releases are far from definitive. Fortunately, the copy protection of Games Past has been circumvented in most cases, allowing you to take it anywhere and play it on anything. Speaking of which... It can run on a potato. The newer the game, the more graphically intense the game, the more powerful a machine you'll need to run the game and you'll forever be playing catch up in the tech stakes. Investing more and more money in the hope that this time it'll really be worth it. The inverse of this technological sunk cost fallacy is also true. You barely pay any money for the game and barely anything for the computer to run it on. If it turns out to be average or worse, it's not a big deal as you can go back and play another highly rated classic instead. So if you have a potato and can't play the latest, you can always settle on playing the greatest, which handily leads us to... Some old games have never been bettered. That's right, I said greatest. Strange as it may seem, there are a number of titles which remain the best in their respective genres, undiminished by the passage of time. Many of these offerings have been treated to remasters in light of this. 
because for whatever reason the modern games industry just can't seem to best these once in a lifetime acts of creative genius. Probably because they're once in a lifetime acts of creative genius in a time where that sort of thing was still encouraged. That or the genres they operated in have been sadly neglected leaving them the last man standing in a graveyard of games they often helped render obsolete. There is more operational variety. Controller layouts have been standardised. PC controls these days are much the same. The majority of games run on a handful of engines. While this is a matter of convenience for many developers, it also means that games are more similar to each other than ever before. Older titles come from a time where the rulebook wasn't so set in stone, and while there were plenty of generic copies and titles with hideous control schemes, it also meant more games felt different to play. They'll throw an idea or concept that you hadn't seen previously and were more brazen with their experimentation. The gaming landscape was a wild west, and you never knew which frontier was going to appear next. Games of the past did more with less. The Apollo Guidance computer took the Americans to the moon. The phone in your pocket has a million times more memory than that system and will most likely do nothing of historical importance. The ideas and actions of developers past were also constrained by the storage medium of their time having somewhere between a kilobyte and a gigabyte to pack their game into for 20 years. This led to feats of technological ingenuity in order to optimise every last byte of storage. Nowadays, excessive amounts of storage space are much more prevalent, and game sizes have ballooned with uncompressed data, badly optimised titles, and a subsequent decline in design philosophy with this additional headroom to operate in. They were designed better. There's a reason indie gaming took off over the course of the last decade, and it wasn't just some knee-jerk reaction to the increasingly movie-like tone of modern titles. Just look up the pixel graphics tag on Steam and you'll be inundated with bright and colourful games that are easy on the eye. I like to call it representational graphics, a style where the purposeful limitation allows the mind an uncluttered environment within which to immerse itself and subsequently paint a picture more powerful than any graphics card ever could. Because in the past limitations were imposed rather than purposeful, this was the default graphical style of the time. As a result, older designers became absolute masters at this less is more art style. And it shows. Nostalgia. It had to get a mention. And because it's the most common reason, I leave it until the end. There's an increasing number of younger people playing games older than they are, because they're evocative of a better time that they never got to experience. Much like sampling the stars of the silver screen and imagining yourself in their worlds, invented or otherwise, the pixelated past that was once modern to us is held with a reverence by the generations that will replace us. And that's why the past was, and is better, than what we have now. <laughs>